Memoirs of General Rapp, First Aide de Camp to Napoleon, Chapter 1. I do not pretend to be a historical character, but I was long near a man who has been the object of base misrepresentations, and I commanded brave troops whose services have been disowned. The former overwhelmed me with favors. The latter would have laid down their lives for me. These things I cannot forget. I served in the army for several years. I was successful in some enterprises, though without gaining distinction, as is usual with those who hold subaltern rank. At length, I was fortunate enough to engage the attention of General Desai. Our advance guard, which had been thrown into disorder, was speedily rallied. I hastened forward with a hundred hussars. We charged the Austrians and succeeded in putting them to flight. We were almost all covered with wounds. But for these, we were amply rewarded by the praises that were bestowed on, upon us. The general made me promise to take all requisite care of myself, and he delivered to me the most flattering attestation that ever a soldier obtained. I mention this circumstance not because it procured me a pair of epaulettes, but because it obtained for me the friendship of that great man and was the origin of my fortune. The attestation was as follows. Army of the Rhine and the Moselle, headquarters at Blutzheim, 13th fruit to door, year three of the French Republic, one and indivisible. I, the undersigned, general division commanding the right wing of the above-mentioned army certified that citizen Jean Rep, lieutenant in the 10th Regiment of Horse Chasseurs, has served under my command with the said regiment during the last two campaigns, that on all occasions he has given proofs of singular intelligence, presence of mind, and courage, that he has been wounded three different times, and that... On the ninth Periel of year two, at the head of a company of chasseurs, he attacked a column of the enemy's hussars, whose number was five times greater than his own force, with such devoted intrepidity that he cut them to pieces, covering the retreat of a portion of our troops and bearing away the honor of the victory. It cannot be too deeply regretted that he has been the victim of his valor and has been dangerously wounded in such a way as to be deprived of the use of his arm. He is a worthy object of national gratitude and well deserves to be appointed to some honorable post should he be rendered incapable of more active service. I test that citizen rep bears with him the friendship and esteem of all who know him. To say, having become the aide-de-camp of the modest conqueror of Offenburg, I fought under him in the campaigns of Germany and Egypt. I was made the chief of a squadron at Sidemen where I had the happiness at the head of 200 brave troops to carry off the last remnant of the Turkish artillery, and I was promoted to the rank of colonel. At Semenu, near the ruins of Thebes, I was severely wounded in this last affair, but I was honorably mentioned in the dispatches of the general chief. On the death of the brave to say, who was killed at Marengo, at the moment when he had decided the victory, the first consul deigned to appoint me to a post about his own person, the favor which he would have conferred on the conqueror of Upper Egypt was extended to me. From that time, I was in some manner permanently established and my connections became more extended. Zeal, frankness, and some degree of military talent procured for me the confidence of Napoleon. He frequently remarked to those about him that few possessed a greater share of natural good sense and discernment than rap. These praises were repeated to me, and I must confess I was flattered by them. If this be weakness, I may be excused. Everyone has some foible. I would have sacrificed my life to prove my gratitude to the first consul. He knew this, and he often repeated to my friends that I was a grumbler, that I had a poor head, but a good heart. He treated both me and Lan familiarly, using the pronoun thou when he spoke to us. If he addressed us by you or Monsieur Le General, we became alarmed. We were sure that we were out of favor. He had the weakness to attach importance to a gossiping police system, which for the most part deceived him by false reports. That odious system of police embittered the happiness of his life. It frequently incensed him against his best friends, his relations, and even his wife. 
Napoleon attached but little importance to mere courage, which he regarded as an ordinary kind of merit common to all Frenchmen. He set a higher value on intrepidity, and he was willing to pardon every fault in an intrepid soldier. When anyone solicited a favor, either at an audience or a view, he never failed to inquire whether he had been wounded. He declared that every wound was a quarter of nobility. He honored and rewarded the individuals who were thus distinguished. And he had good reasons for so doing. However, he soon perceived that they did not attend the antechambers and he opened them to the old nobility. This preference offended us. He remarked this and was displeased at our taking offense. I see plainly, said he to me one day, that these nobles whom I have placed in my household are disagreeable to you. I, however, very well deserve the privilege. I had erased several gentlemen from the list of emigrants. I had procured places for some and had given money and pensions to others. Some have remained... Remembered these favors, but the majority have forgotten them, and consequently my purse has been closed since the return of the king. Though my object was to relieve misfortune and not to obtain gratitude, yet I did not choose that the emigrants should interpose between us and the great man whom we had raised on the shield. I had forgotten this disagreeable scene, but Napoleon did not forget any offensive observations that might escape him. In vain, he sought to assume the mask of severity. His natural disposition subdued his efforts and kind feelings, always gained the ascendancy. He called me to him. He spoke to me of the nobles and the emigrants, and suddenly recurring to the scene above alluded to, he said, you think then that I have a predilection for these people. But you are mistaken. I employ them, and you know why. Am I connected with nobility? I, who was a poor Corsican gentleman? Neither I nor the army, I replied, have ever inquired into your origin. Your actions are sufficient for us. I related the conversation to several of my friends, among others, Generals Mouton and Loriston. Most of these same nobles, however, alleged that they had yielded only to compulsion. Nothing could be more false. I know of only two who received Chamberlain's appointments unsolicited. Some few declined advantageous offers, but with these exceptions, all solicited, entreated, and importuned. There was a competition of zeal and devotedness altogether unexampled. The meanest employment, the humblest offices, nothing was rejected. It seemed to be an affair of life and death. Should a treacherous hand ever find its way into the portfolios of Messieurs Talleyrand, Montesquieu, Segur, Direct, etc., what art expressions may be found to enrich the language of attachment? But the individuals who held this language now vie with each other in giving vent to hatred, and in fact, of if they really felt for Napoleon the profound hatred which they now evince. It must be confessed that in crouching at the feet for 15 years, they did strange violence to their feelings. And yet all Europe can bear witness that from their unrestrained manner, their never varying smile, their supple marks of obedience, their service seemed to be of their own free choice and to cost them but little sacrifice. Chapter 2. Many persons have described Napoleon as a violent, harsh, and passionate man. This is because they have not known him. Absorbed as he was in important business, opposed in his views, and impeded in his plans, it was certainly natural that he should sometimes evince impatience and inequality of temper. His natural kindness and generosity soon subdued his irritation, but it must be observed that far from seeking to appease him, his confidence never failed to excite his anger. Your majesty is right, they would say. Such a one deserves to be shot or broken, dismissed or disgraced. I have long known him to be your enemy. An example must be made. It is necessary for the maintenance of tranquility. If the matter in question had been to levy contributions to the enemy's territory, Napoleon perhaps would demand 20 millions, but he would be advised to exact 10 million more. He would be told by those about him, it is necessary that your majesty should spare your treasury, that you should maintain your troops at the expense of foreign countries or leave them to subsist on territory of the confederation. 
If he entertained the idea of levying 200,000 conscripts, he was persuaded to demand 300,000. If he proposed to pay a creditor whose right was unquestionable, doubts were started respecting the legality of the debt. The amount claimed was perhaps reduced to one half or one third, and not unfrequently happened that the debt was denied altogether. He spoke of commencing war. The bold resolution was applauded. It was said war enriched France, that it was necessary to astonish the world and to astonish it in a way worthy of a great nation. Thus, by being excited and urged to enter upon uncertain plans and enterprises, Napoleon was plunged into continual war. Thus it was that his reign was impressed with an air of violence, contrary to his own character and habits, which were perfectly gentle. Never was there a man more inclined to indulgence or more ready to listen to the voice of humanity. Of this, I could mention a thousand examples, but I confine myself to the following. George and his accomplices had been condemned. Josephine interceded for Monsieur Polignac and Murat for Monsieur de Riviere. And both succeeded in their mediation. On the day of execution, the banker Scherer hastened to St. Cloud, bathed in tears, and asked to speak with me. He begged of me to solicit the pardon of his brother in law, Monsieur de Roussillon, an old Swiss major who had been implicated in the affair. He was accompanied by some of his countrymen, all relatives of the prisoner. They observed that they were conscious that the major merited his sentence but that he was the father of a family and that he was allied to the most distinguished houses in the canton of Bern. I yielded to their entreaties, and I had no reason to regret having done so. It was seven in the morning. Napoleon was up and in his closet with Corvisar when I was announced. Sire, said I, it is not long since your majesty settled the government of Switzerland by your mediation, but you know that the people are not all equally satisfied. The inhabitants of Bern, in particular, you have now an opportunity of proving to them your magnanimity and generosity. One of their countrymen is to be executed this day. He is connected with the best families in the country, if you grant his pardon, it will certainly produce a great sensation and procure you many friends. Who is this man? What is his name? inquired Napoleon. Roussillon, I replied. On hearing this name, he became angry. Roussillon, said he, is more guilty than George himself. I am fully aware of all that your majesty now does me the honor to tell me, but the people of Switzerland, his family, his children will bless you. Pardon him, not on his own account, for the sake of the many brave men who have suffered for his folly. Hark ye, said he, turning to Corvisar, while he took the petition from my hand, approved it, and hastily returned it to me. Immediately dispatched a courier to suspend the execution. The joy of the family may be easily guessed. To me, they testified their gratitude through the medium of the public papers. Roussillon was imprisoned along with his accomplices, but he afterwards obtained his liberty since the return of the king. He has several times visited Paris, though I have not seen him. He thinks that I attach but little importance to the act of service I rendered him. And he is right. Chapter 3. No man possessed greater sensibility or evinced more constancy in his affections than Napoleon. He tenderly loved his mother. He adored his wife. He was fondly attached to his sisters, brothers, and other relatives. All, with the exception of his mother, caused him the bitterest vexation. Yet he never ceased to overwhelm them with riches and honors of all his relations. His brother Lucian proved himself the most determined opposer of his views and plans. One day, while they were disputing warmly on a subject which has now escaped my recollection, Lucian drew out his watch and dashed it violently on the ground. He addressed it to his he addressed to his brother these remarkable words. You will destroy yourself as I have destroyed that watch. And the time will come when your family and friends will not know where to shelter their heads. He married a few days after, without obtaining his brother's consent or even signifying his intention to him. This, however, did not prevent Napoleon from receiving him in 1815, though it was not without being urged to do so. Lucien was obliged to wait at the outpost, but he was speedily admitted 
to the emperor's presence. Napoleon did not confine his generosity to his relatives, friendships, services. All met their due reward. On this, I can speak from experience. I returned from Egypt in the rank of aide-de-camp to the brave general to say, and with 200 louis which I had saved, and which constituted my whole fortune. At the time of the abdication, I possessed an income of 400,000 francs, arising out of endowments, appointments, emulations, extraordinary allowances, ETC. I have lost five-sixths of this income, but I do not regret it. That which I still possess forms a vast contrast to my early fortune. But what I regret is the glory acquired at the price of so much blood and exertion. It is forever lost, and for that I am inconsolable. I was not the only one who shared the bounty of Napoleon. A thousand others were in like manner overwhelmed the favors and the injury which he suffered through the misconduct of some. Pro proved no bar to the exercise of his kindness. Whatever it might be the depths of these injuries, they were forgotten as soon as he was convinced that the heart had no share in producing them. I could say a hundred instances of his indulgence in this respect, but the following will suffice. When he took the title of emperor, the changes that were made in his household, which had been hitherto exclusively military, gave umbrage to several of us. We had been accustomed to enjoy the intimacy of the great man, and we felt displeased at the reserve imposed upon us by the imperial purple. Generals Rignier and Demas were at that time in disgrace. I was intimate with both, and I was not in the habit of abandoning my friends in misfortune. I had exerted every effort to remove Napoleon's prejudices against these two general officers, but without success. I one day resumed my intercession in favor of Rignier and Napoleon becoming impatient and out of humor, told me dryly that he wished to hear no more about him. I wrote to inform the brave general that all my endeavors had proved unavailing. I entreated him to have patience and added a few phrases dictated by the disappointment of the moment. I was so imprudent as to entrust my letter to the conveyance of the post. And the consequence was that it was open and sent to the emperor. He read it over there three or four times, ordered some of my writing to be brought to him for the purpose of comparing it and could scarcely persuade himself that I had written it. He flew into a violent rage and dispatched a courier from St. Cloud to the Tuileries where I was lodged. I thought I was summoned for a mission and set out immediately. I found Calicourt in the saloon of the household with Caffarelli, and I asked him what was the news. He had heard the whole affair. He seemed much vexed by it, but he said not a word about it to me. I entered the apartments of Napoleon, who came out of his closet with the letter in his hand in a furious rage. He darted upon me those angry glances, which so often excited dismay. Do you know this writing, said he? Yes, sire. Is it yours? Yes, sire. You are the last person. I should have suspected this. Is it possible that you can hold such language to my enemies? You, whom I have treated so well? You, for whom I have done so much? You, the only one of my aides the camp? Who I lodged at the Tuileries? The door of his closet was ajar. He observed this and he threw it wide open in order that Monsieur Meneval, one of the secretaries, might hear it passed. Be gone, said he, scanning me from head to foot. Be gone. You are an ungrateful man. Sire, I replied. My heart was never guilty of ingratitude. Read this letter, said he, presenting to me, and judge whether I accuse you wrongly. Sire, all the reproaches that you can heap upon me. This is the most severe. Having lost your confidence, I can no longer serve you. Yes, you have indeed forfeited my confidence. I bowed respectfully and withdrew. I resolved to retire to Alsace, and I was making preparations for my departure when Josephine sent a desire to see me to return and make my best apologies to Napoleon. Louis, however, gave me contrary advice and I was not much inclined to obey the directions of the Empress, as my resolution had formed. Two days elapsed, and I heard no news from St. Clue. Some friends among whom was Marshal Bessier called on me. You are in the wrong, said the Marshal. You cannot but acknowledge it. The respect and gratitude you owe to the Emperor rendered a duty to confess your fault. 
I yielded to these suggestions. No sooner had Napoleon received my letter than he desired me to attend him in one of his rides on horseback. He was out of humor with me for some time, but one day he sent for me very early at St. Cloud. I am no longer angry with you, said he, with exceeding kindness of manner. You were guilty of a great piece of folly, but it is all over. I have forgotten it. It is my wish that you should marry. He mentioned two young ladies, either of whom he said would suit me. My marriage was brought about, but unfortunately... It did not prove to be a happy one. Bernadotte was in the deepest disgrace, and he deserved it. I met him at Plombier, whither he had been permitted to go, accompanied by his wife and son, for the benefit of the waters, and I had visited the place for the same purpose. I had always admired Bernadotte's kind and amiable disposition. I saw him frequently at Plombier. He communicated to me the circumstance that most distressed him, and begged that I would use my influence to bring about his... Reconciliation with the emperor, whom he said he had never ceased to admire, and who had been prepossessed against him by calumnious reports. On my return, I learned that his friends, his brother-in-law, and Madame Julie herself, had uselessly interceded in his behalf. The point would hear nothing they had to say, and his irritation was set against Bernadotte continually. But I had promised to do what I could for him, and I was bound to keep my word. The emperor was preparing to set out for Villiers, where Murat was to give a fete. He was in high good humor, and I determined to avail myself of this favorable circumstance. I communicated my design to Marshal Pissier, who with myself was to attend the emperor. He tried to dissuade me from my intention. He informed me that Madame Julie... Had that very morning been in Malmaison, that she had departed in tears for the ill success of her suit. This circumstance was not calculated to inspire me with confidence, but I nevertheless ventured on my mediation. I informed Napoleon that I had seen Bernadotte at Plombier, that he was dejected and deeply mortified by his disgrace. He protests, added I, that he has ever failed in his love and devotion for your majesty. Do not speak of him. He deserves to be shot, said Napoleon. And he set off at full gallop. At Murat's fete, I met Joseph and his wife. And I told them how unlucky I had been. The affair came to the knowledge of Bernadotte, who thanked me for my good intentions. Notwithstanding his numerous misunderstandings with Bernadotte, Napoleon subsequently forgave all his past offenses and loaded him with wealth and honors. The Prince Royal is now about to ascend the throne while the author of his fortune is exiled to a rock in the midst of the ocean. Chapter 4. It has been affirmed that Napoleon was not brave. A man who, from the rank of lieutenant of artillery, rose to be the ruler of a nation like France, could not surely be deficient in courage. Of this his conduct on the 18th Brumaire, on the 5th Nivose, and during the plot of Arena, are sufficient proofs. If proofs were wanting. He was well aware how numerous were his enemies among the Jacobins and the Chouans. Yet every evening he walked out in the streets of Paris and mingled with the different groups, never accompanied by more than two individuals. Landroc, Bessier, or some of his East Camp usually attended him in these nocturnal excursions. This fact was well known throughout Paris. The affair of the infernal machine has never been properly understood by the public. The police had intimated to Napoleon that an attempt would be made against his life and cautioned him not to go out. Madame Bonaparte, Mademoiselle Beauharnais, Madame Murat, Land Bessier, the aide de camp on duty, and Lieutenant Lebrun, now Duke of Placenza, were all assembled in the saloon while the first consul was writing in his closet. Heinz Arturio was to be performed that evening. The ladies were anxious to hear the music. We also expressed a wish to that effect. The escort, Piquet, was ordered out, and Lan requested that Napoleon would join the party. He consented. His carriage was ready, and he took along with him Bessier and the aide de camp a duty. I was directed to attend the ladies. Josephine had received a magnificent shawl from Constantinople, and she that evening wore it for the first time. Allow me to observe it, madame, said I, that your shawl is not thrown on 
with your usual elegance. She good-humoredly begged that I would fold it after the fashion of the Egyptian ladies. While I was engaged in this operation, we heard Napoleon depart. Come, sister, said Madame Yura, who was impatient to go to the theater. Bonaparte is going. We stepped into the carriage. The first consul's equipage had already reached the middle of the place carousel. We drove after it, but we had scarcely entered the place when the machine exploded. Napoleon escaped by a singular chance. St. Regent, or his French servant, had stationed himself in the middle of the Rue de Quez. A grenadier of the escort, supposing he was really what he appeared to be, a water carrier, gave him a few blows with the flat of his saber and drove him off. The cart was turned around and the machine exploded between the carriages of Napoleon and Josephine. The ladies shrieked on hearing the report. The carriage windows were broken and Mademoiselle Beauharnais received a sight hurt on her hand. I alighted and crossed the Rue de Cas, which was strewn with the bodies of those who had been thrown out and the fragments of the walls that had been shattered by the explosion. Neither the consul nor any individual of his suite sustained any serious injury. When I entered the theater, Napoleon was seated in his box, calm and composed, and looking at the audience through his opera glass. Fouché was beside him. Josephine, said he, as soon as he observed me. She entered at that moment, and he did not finish his question. The rascals, said he, very coolly, wanted to blow me up. Bring me a book of the oratorio. The audience soon learned the danger he had escaped, and they saluted him with testimonies of the deepest interest. These, I think, are unequivocal proofs of courage. The men who have followed him on the field of battle cannot be at a loss to quote many more. Chapter 5. Napoleon, whatever his detractors may say, was neither overbearing nor obstinate in his opinions. He was eager to obtain information, and he wished to hear the opinions of all who were entitled to hold any. Among the members of the council, the wish to please him sometimes superseded every other consideration. But when he perceived this, he never failed to restore the discussion to its proper tone. Gentlemen, he would say to his lieutenants, I summon you here not to bring you over to my opinion, but to let me hear yours. Explain to me your views, and I shall see whether the plans which you propose are better than my own. While we were at Bologna, he gave a lesson of this kind to the minister of the marine. He had proposed some questions, to which Mr. de Cres replied only by a string of compliments. Pauline wrote to him thus, I beg you will send me in course of tomorrow a memorial on the following question. In the present state of affairs, what is most proper to be done? Should Admiral Villeneuve remain at Cadiz? Raise your mind to the importance of present circumstances and the situation in which France and England are placed. Send me no more letters like that which you addressed to me yesterday. They can answer no purpose. I have but one wish, and that is to succeed, for which I pray God. ETC. Two days before the Battle of Austerlitz, a portion of the army was stationed in an unfavorable position, and the general who occupied it exaggerated its disadvantages. However, when the council was assembled, he not only admitted that the position was tenable, but he even promised to defend it. How is this? Marshal, said the Grand Duke of Berg, Mira, what has become of the doubts you expressed but a short while ago? What signifies flattering when we have met for the purpose of deliberating, said Marshal Land in his turn. We must represent things in their true light to the emperor and leave him to do what he may deem expedient. You are right, said Napoleon. Those who wish to win my good graces must not deceive me. But though he was always ready to receive advice from those who were qualified to give it, yet he could not endure remarks made by individuals who might happen to be ignorant on the subject of which they were speaking. Fesch was one day about to make some observations on the Spanish war. He had severely uttered two words when Napoleon, leading him to a window, said, Do you see that star? It was known. And the archbishop replied that he saw none. Well, said Napoleon, so long as I am the only one who perceives it, I will pursue my own course and will hear no reflections on my conduct. On his return from the Russian campaign, he was lamenting with deep emotion the death of many brave men who had been sacrificed 
not by Cossack spears, but by the rigors of cold and hunger. A courtier who wished to throw in his words said with a very doleful air, We have indeed sustained a severe loss. Yes, replied Napoleon. Madame Borelli is dead. He always sneered at folly, but he never shewed himself averse either to pleasantry or frankness. Madame Bachiorchki one day brought to the Tuileries her relations, Monsieur de A. She retired after introducing him to the salon of the household, and he was left alone with me. This Monsieur de A, like many of his countrymen, had a very unprepossessing countenance. I was distrustful of him, but nevertheless, he informed the emperor he was waiting, and he was introduced. I had doubtless something important to communicate. Napoleon, by a motion of his hand, directed me to return to the saloon. I pretended not to observe him, and I remained, for I was apprehensive for safety. He advanced towards me and said that they wished to be alone. I then withdrew, but I left the door of the chamber partly open. When Napoleon had dismissed Monsieur de A, he asked me why I had been so reluctant to withdraw. You know, replied I, that I am not officious. But I must frankly confess that I do not like your Corsicans. He himself related this anecdote, which displeased some of the individuals of his family. However, I am persuaded that he would rather not have heard me speak of his countrymen in this way. One evening after the Battle of Vagram, we were playing at Vagnon. Napoleon was very fond of this game. He used to try to deceive those he was playing with and was much amused at the tricks he played. He had a great quantity of gold spread out upon the table before him. Rap, said he, are not the Germans very fond of these little Napoleons? Yes, sire, they like them much better than the great one. That, I suppose, said he, is what you call German frankness. Chapter 6. I was at the camp of Bologna. When the third war with Austria broke out, the French were passing the Rhine. The remnants of the enemy's army, which had been beaten and nearly cut to pieces, shut themselves up at Ulm, and they were immediately summoned to surrender. The account of this negotiation, which was conducted by Monsieur de Segur, so well portrays the confusion and anxiety of the unfortunate general, and I cannot refrain from inserting it here. The following is Monsieur de Segur's own statement. Yesterday, the 24th of Vendemir, 16th of October, the emperor desired me to attend him in his closet. He directed me to proceed to Ulm and to prevent on, prevail on General Mack to surrender in five days or if he absolutely required six. I was to allow him that time. I received no other instructions. The night was dark. Terrible hurricane arose and the rain poured in torrents. It was necessary to travel by crossroads and to adopt every precaution for avoiding the marshes in which man, horse, and mission might all have come to an untimely end. I had almost reached the gates of the city without finding any of our advanced parties. All had withdrawn sentinels, vedettes, outposts, and all had placed themselves under shelter. Even the parks of artillery were abandoned. No fires, no stars were visible. I wandered about for three hours before I could find a general. I passed through several villages and interrogated all all whom I met, but without receiving any satisfactory answer. At length, I found an artillery trumpeter beneath a cassoon, half buried in mud and stiff with cold. We approached the ramparts of Ulm. Our arrival had doubtless been expected, for Monsieur de la Tour, an officer who spoke French very well, presented himself on the first summons. He tied a bandage over my eyes and made me climb over the fortifications. I remarked to my guide that the extreme darkness of the night rendered it unnecessary to blindfold me, but he replied that it was a custom that could not be dispensed with. We seemed to have walked in a considerable way. I entered into conversation with my guide. My object was to ascertain what number of troops were shut up in the city? I inquired whether we were far from the residence of General Mack and the Archduke. They are close at hand, replied my guide. I concluded that all the remains of the Austrian army were in Ulm, and the sequel of the conversation confirmed me in this conjecture. At length, we reached the inn where the general chief resided. He was a tall elderly man, and the expression of his pallid countenance denoted a lively imagination. His features were disturbed by a feeling of anxiety, which he endeavored to conceal. 
after exchanging a few compliments. I told him my name, and then entering upon the subject of my mission, I informed him that the emperor had sent me to invite him to surrender and to settle with him the conditions of the capitulation. These words evidently offended him. And at first he seemed disinclined to listen to me further, but I insisted on being hurt. I observed that having been received, I, as well as the emperor, might naturally suppose that he knew how to appreciate his condition. But he replied sharply that his situation would soon be changed, as the Russian army was advancing to his assistance, that we should be placed between two fires, and it would then be our turn to capitulate. I replied that, situated as he was, it was not surprising he should be ignorant of what was passing in Germany, but that I must inform him Marshal Bernadette was in possession of Ingolstadt and Munich, and that he had his advance posts on the end, where the Russians had not yet shown themselves. May I be the greatest blank, exclaimed General Mank, angrily, if I am not positively informed that the Russians are at Dachau. Do you think to impose on me thus? Do you take me for a boy? No, Monsieur de Seeker. If I receive not assistance within eight days, I consent to surrender my fortress on condition that my troops shall be prisoners of war and my officers prisoners on parole. Eight days will allow time for affording me assistance, and I shall thus fulfill my duty. But I shall receive aid, I am certain. Allow me to repeat, General, that we are masters not only of Dachau, but of Munich also. Besides, allowing your supposition to be correct, if the Russians really be at Dachau, five days will enable them to advance and attack us, and these five days His Majesty is willing to grant you. No, sir, replied the Marshal, I demand eight days. I can listen to no other proposition. I must have eight days. That period is indispensable to my responsibility. Then resumed I, the whole difficulty consists in settling the difference between five and eight days. But I cannot conceive why your excellency should attach so much importance to this point, seeing that the emperor is before you at the head of a hundred thousand men, and that the court of Marshal Bernadotte and General Marmont are sufficient to retard for three days the advance of the Russians, even supposing them to be where they really are, far from being. They are at the cow, replied General Mack. Well, Baron, be it so. And even allowing them to be at Augsburg, we should only be the more ready to come to an agreement with you. Do not force us to carry Ulm by assault, for then, instead of waiting five days, it will be but a morning's work for the emperor to gain possession of it. Sir, replied the general chief, do not imagine that 15,000 men are so easily subdued that conquest will cost you dear. Perhaps a few hundred men, I replied, while Germany will reproach you with the loss of your army and the destruction of Ulm. In short, with all the horrors of an assault which His Majesty seeks to prevent by the proposition which he has charged me to make to you. Rather say, exclaimed the marshal, that it will cost you 10,000 men. The strength of Ulm is known. It consists in the heights which surround it and which are in our possession. Come, come, sir, it is impossible that you can be ignorant of the strength of Ulm. Certainly not, Marshal. I am the better able to appreciate it now that I am within the walls of the city. Well, sir, resumed the unfortunate general, you see men ready to defend themselves to the utmost extremity should your emperor refuse to grant them an armistice of eight dates. I can hold out for a considerable time. Ulm contains 3,000 horses, which rather than surrender, we will eat with as much pleasure as you would were you in our place. Three thousand horses! I exclaimed. Alas, Marshal, you must look forward to dreadful misery before you can think of trusting to so pitiful a resource. The Marshal eagerly assured me that he had provisions for ten days, but I believe no such thing. Day was beginning to dawn, and the negotiation was no farther advanced than at the commencement of our interview. I might have granted six days, but General Max so obstinately insisted on eight that I concluded that the concession of a single day would be useless. I would not incur the risk, and I rose to depart, saying that my instructions required me to return before daylight, and in my case, my proposition should be rejected to transmit to Marshal Ney the order for commencing the attack. Here, General Mack complained of the conduct of the Marshal towards one of his flags of truce, whose message he had refused to hear. I availed myself of this circumstance to remark that the Marshal's temper was hasty and 
impetuous and a governable that he commanded the most numerous corps and that which was nearest the city that he impatiently awaited the order to commence the assault which order I was to transmit to him on my departure from Ulm. The old general, however, was not intimidated. He insisted on being allowed an interval of eight days and urged me to make the proposal to the emperor. Poor General Mack was on the point of citing his own ruin and that of Austria, but notwithstanding his desperate situation in which he must have suffered the most cruel anxiety, he still refused to yield and preserved his presence of mind and maintained the dispute in an animated way. He defended the only thing that he could defend, namely time. He sought to retard the fall of Austria, of which he had himself been the cause and wished to procure her a few days longer for preparation. When lost himself, he still contended for her. His character, which was political rather than military, led him to exert cunning. In opposition to power, he was bewildered amidst a crowd of conjectures. About nine in the morning of the 25th, I rejoined the emperor at the Albi. Abbey of Elishingen, where I rendered him on account of the negotiation. He appeared quite satisfied, and I left him. He, however, desired me to attend him again. And finding that I did not come at the very moment, he sent Marshal Berthier to me with a written copy of the propositions which he wished me to induce General Mack to sign immediately. The emperor granted the Austrian general eight days, reckoning from the date of the 23rd, the first day of the blockade. Thus their number was in reality reduced to six, which I might at first have proposed, but which I would not concede. However, in case of obstinate refusal, I was authorized to date the eight days from the 25th, and thus the emperor would still have gained a day by the concession. The object was to enter Ulm speedily in order to augment the glory of the victory by its rapidity to reach Vienna before the town should recover from the shock or the Russian army could be in a situation to act. And finally, our provisions were beginning to fail us, which was another reason for urging us on. Major General Marshal Bertier intimated to me that he would approach the town and that if the conditions were agreed upon, he should be glad if I would procure his admittance. I returned to Ulm about noon. The precautions which had been observed on my first visit were again repeated, but on this occasion I found General Mack at the gate of the city. I delivered to him the Emperor's ultimatum, and he withdrew to deliberate upon it with several of his generals, among whom I observed a Prince of Liechtenstein and Generals Klenau and Ginlay. In about a quarter of an hour, he returned and again began a dispute with me respecting the date. He mistook some particular point in the written propositions, and this induced him to believe that he would obtain an armistice of eight whole days, reckoning from the 25th in a singular transport of joy. He exclaimed, Monsieur de Secure, my dear Monsieur de Secure, I relied on the Emperor's generosity, and I have not been deceived. Tell Marshal Berthier I respect him. Tell the Emperor that I have only a few trifling observations to make, and that I will sign the propositions you have brought me, but inform His Majesty that Marshal Ney has behaved ill to me that he has treated me most disrespectfully, assure the emperor that I relied on his generosity. Then, with increased warmth of feeling, he had, Monsieur de Segur, I value your esteem. I attach importance to the opinion that you may entertain of me. I wish to show you the paper I have signed, for I assure you my determination was fixed. So saying, he unfolded a sheet of paper in which were written these words, Eight days or death, sighed Mac. I was thunderstruck at the joyful expression which animated his countenance. I was enabled to account for the puerile triumph he evinced in so vain a concession, when on the point of sinking. To what a frail twig did the poor general cling in the hope of preserving his own reputation, the honor of his army, and ensuring the safety of Austria. He took my hand, pressed it cordially, and suffered me to depart from Ulm without being blindfolded. He, moreover, allowed me to introduce Mar Marshal Bertier into the fortress without the observance of the usual formalities. In short, he appeared perfectly delighted. He started in the presence of Marshal Bertier another argument respecting the dates. I explained the mistake that had occurred, and the matter was to be referred to the emperor. In the morning, the general assured me 
that he had provisions for ten days, but I had already intimated to his majesty that he appeared to have a very short supply, which indeed proved to be the case. For that very day, he solicited permission to have provision conveyed to the fortress. <laughs>